here and join with Janae right here in the front. So we're going to sing a song from probably 1600, and she's going to do a dance to it. I don't know if they did the same dances back then, but she's going to lead it for the kiddos. Come on, kids. All the kids. Yeah, yeah. All yep. the Catherine's kids. there. Catherine. Yes. Where's my daughter at? Oh, okay. She. Oh, oh, yep, there you go. All right, here we go. Not done yet. I think you guys will like this one. Yeah, let's all stand. Come on. Everyone can dance on this one. Come on, you guys know this.
happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus was. That's what they sang at the tomb. Probably not, because that didn't come out till 1960 something. <laughs> but it was a happy day for them, I guarantee it. Just like it's a happy day for us. And Lord, we celebrate your resurrection today. We thank you, Lord, for going to the cross, for bearing the punishment, and for rising again, for your heartbeat starting and you walking out of the grave. Lord, in all eternity, we're not going to know what that fully means. But we're going to worship you. And may our worship here today glorify and lift you on high into your rightful place in our hearts and in this church. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, there's a lot of people here today. Go say hi to someone. Good morning, church. 
Happy Easter. He, he's risen. If you want to make your way back to your seats. <clears throat> Uh, so, I was, actually, I was thinking about Easter this week, um, I was uh, reminded of this song, it's called Amazing Love, and uh, one of the verses says, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive and well, and your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. And that's why we're here today, and what Easter is all about to celebrate and praise God for his amazing love for us and how he loved us so much that he died for us and rose again so that we may have eternal life in Jesus and have a personal relationship with him. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, we're happy to have you here and we hope you experience God this morning and the love that he has for you. After the service, uh, I'd like to invite you to fill out a visitor card. It's in front of you in the chair pocket. And when you go out the double doors, there's a prayer box that you can put your card in. Um, <clears throat> so now I have, I have a couple announcements for you guys, but first uh, I've been trying to think of announcements kind of more as opportunities. Uh, and I invite you to do, to do the same. That is opportunities to fellowship with one another and grow in Christ together. Hebrews uh, 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So I encourage, uh, that's my encouragement to all of us, that we see these announcements as opportunities to do that, to get together and stir up each other in love and good works, and to be an encouragement to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So these announcements will be more of a reminder to you if you were here last week. So uh, again, <clears throat> if you want to experience the mess Messianic uh, Passover Seder, Buell Bible Church is hosting that Thursday the 18th at 6 p.m. Sign up as soon as possible so they know how much food to prepare, come hungry, ready to worship, and learn about how we see Jesus through the Passover Seder. Lastly, there will be a Bible study called the Whosoever's that will be studying the biblical foundation of uh, who Jesus is through the book of John. This is starting up April 9th and will be on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Sign up in the lobby. Uh, it's next to the Daily Bible Reading Board. And for more information to sign up for these events and other events, please go to either BuellBibleChurch.com or on the BBC app. And again, visitors, thank you for being here today. And please enjoy the rest of the Easter service. Thank you. Isn't he just a blessing? He is risen. What a glorious Easter morning. Even though it's snowing and cold, it is spring, people. It is actually spring. So I want to bring your attention to the ladies' tea. We moved the date a little bit earlier this year. We have it in April 20th. Many of you are used to Mother's Day weekend, so we backed up the date a little bit. My dear friend and also Lori Campbell's cousin, Shannon Hughes, will be joining us from Calvary Chapel Emmett. She's one of the very first people I ever met in Idaho. We've been dear friends for years. She has some miracle stories of how God has worked in her life, and she has a wonderful message planned for us. So I hope you ladies will save that date. It is from 1 to 4 p.m., a little bit later this year on a Saturday. We're going to have high tea, and we're going to keep um, it a really a relaxed atmosphere. Now, you can be fancy like me. I didn't bring my, t my hat. I couldn't find it. I went to go get it for you because it matches this dress. I wore this a couple years ago at a ladies' tea. Couldn't find it for you. I'm so sorry. But you can play dress up like me. If you're a big girl that wants to be a play little girl dress up, I'm all in with you, girl. Um, or you can come just as you are. So we don't want you to think that that's just because it's tea. It doesn't mean that you have to be all dressed up. But what I want you to do is think about this. It's for all ages. We want your little girls to come. So the cost is very affordable. It's only $10 or for $5 for the little girls. And we have a little girl tea party table. And then during the message, we have an opportunity for them to have a message for their um, 
mind uh, attention span and some crafts for them to do. And so it's really for everybody. Invite your friends. It's a wonderful evangelical opportunity. A lot of ladies will come to a tea that won't set foot in a church, but they will come for this. So invite your neighbors, invite your friends. And I just really want to ask you this too. I'm, I'm in need of hostesses. So I personally am a dish hoarder, so I can actually set a few tables off of myself. So if you don't have any dishes, just come and help me pour tea. So I have information for you out there on the table. If you have any questions, if you want to sign up, signups are available on the app right now or on the website. We have information and flyers for you at the table. Please come and join us for this awesome event, April 20th, ladies. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little scripture for us to exhort us into worship this morning as we start our praise portion. Uh, obviously, we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday today, Easter. Jesus is raised. This is out of Matthew chapter 28. Now, after the Sabbath, at the dawning on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to view the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came up and rolled away the stone and sat down on it. Now his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards trembled from the fear of him, and they became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. And as Jesus was raised to life again, he was then ascended on high to sit at the right hand of the power of God forever. And as we sing this song, we're going to join in with the heavenly choir of the holiness of God. Holy forever. He's holy forever. And, and here's, the, here's the reality. We aren't. But thank God that he took the step to come to us. So let's pray. Lord, as we, as we praise you this morning, as we worship you and sing glorious praises to your name, God. I ask that you would inhabit the praises, open up our eyes to your presence here this morning, and bless this time of offering to you. In Jesus' name. If you want to stand with us, please stand. If you want to remain seated, that's fine. Let's just worship the Lord together. forever to the land 
praises what other splendor how 
shines the sun What other majesty rules with justice Only a holy God Come and behold Him The one and the only Cry out Sing holy Forever a holy God Come and worship the holy could rescue me from my failing who else would offer his only son who else invites me to call him father only a holy through the shadows of my soul. Your work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine 
lifted high, forever he is exalted. We are high and lifted up, God. We praise you this morning, Lord. The lion of the tribe of Judah, as we sing, out of the silence, the roaring lion. Declare, not only does the grave have no victory on him, but us as well, because we believe in him. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. This morning, let's just take a few minutes. You can sit down. Let's take a, let's take a few minutes and uh, we're going we're gonna to do something a little different than we normally do for prayer. I just want to take a few minutes and, and give our thanksgiving to the Lord this morning. The Bible says, don't be anxious about anything but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your requests known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So let's take a minute. Just give your thanks to the Lord. Say it loud so everyone can agree and amen with you. Amen.
I'll sing this right here. And we exalt thee. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. Oh Lord. And we exalt thee. We lift you high. things up as a sacrifice of praise to your throne. Continue to be magnified through the reading of your word, through the preaching of your word this morning, that the, the lost sinners would find their way as we are all lost without you, God. We ask that. What sort of promise was this? What sort of Messiah had come? That in the hands of mere men, his life would succumb? What happened to the miracles? What happened to calming the waves? Now there's only darkness surrounding, and there's hell to be paid. It wasn't supposed to end this way. He had only just begun. And the prophecy told us he was supposed to be the one. The one who bring freedom from these laws like prison chains. The one who reconciled the people by the power of his name. Yet here he is, betrayed and deserted on a cross. And after crying out to his father, even he seems lost. And as he exhaled his last, the whole earth shook in a rage the veil was ravaged and the savior was slain but lo in the grave he would not stay for death could not hold the savior at bay for the darkest of night comes just before dawn and with the next breath he took the messiah had won and as he emerged from that tomb, no longer a slave to the darkness that swore it would swallow his name, the cords of his death trembled, retreated, and cowered, his sentence repealed by the evidence of his power. And behold, a new age dawned of redemption through grace, where the stains of our sins could no longer be traced, forever washed clean by the blood that he shed, made new in the life that was raised from the dead. And what do we have to do to receive such a prize? Since we call on his name and open our eyes. For his name is the name that changes our story. When our tongues profess the name of the King of glory, and not Herod, not Judas, not a Roman or high priest, not a tempter, not a serpent, not the rugged corpse of a tree could ever stop, ever stall any part of his plan. For his name is Jesus, the great I am.
Sorry about that. <laughs> Pulling double duty, doing sound. and All right. So the reading today um, is First Peter 3, or sorry, chapter 1, verse 3 through 12. <clears throat> um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This, in this you rejoice, through now, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring, that, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted, to, predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Right, Heavenly Father, um, thank you again for, for today and for, your, for dying on the cross for us and, and resurrecting, Lord. Um, so that we could be saved and have a relationship with you and eternal life. And that is just amazing and it's something to be celebrated. And we just praise you for that, Lord, for your sacrifice, um, the ultimate form of love, laying down one's life for one's friends. Lord, just uh, bless the rest of this service, bless your word, um, and just be with us today, your presence here, Lord. Speak to us. And uh, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> See you guys. Well, how's resurrection morning for you guys so far? <clears throat> so this morning, taking a break from the book of Galatians and jumping into 1 Peter 1, uh, 3 through 12, to take a look at our living hope. There's three questions <clears throat> we're going to try to answer this morning as we look at this text. First, where did it come from, this living hope that we receive? What is my future hope? And what is my present hope? So let's jump in. It says in verse 3, chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our first question, where did it come from? Well, <clears throat> there are several things we can pick up from verse 3. One of those things is... It's according to his great mercy, which means I didn't earn it. I didn't earn this. This is free. I do not deserve this. This is not a payment for something owed. In fact, Romans 6.23 would tell me that the wages of sin is, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we look at the reality, there's, there's, if we're going to understand where it comes from, the first thing we need to know is it comes from the mercy of God. The Bible calls it 
grace. <clears throat> now, sometimes words can be overused. Perhaps we have put that word a bit to the test, but the idea is that it is not deserved. In fact, when we look at Ephesians chapter 2, it's one of my favorite sections of Scripture. I say that every time I talk about somewhere in the Bible that we're going to go. But in Ephesians 2, it talks about uh, the night of the living dead. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses in sin, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work um, in the sons of disobedience, among whom, listen to this, we all once lived. We all come from the same place. We all come from a position of separation from God, separation from his holiness, separation from his presence, separation from uh, being able to uh, experience um, a relationship with God Most High. Our normal state, the way we walked through this world, the way we lived our life. Do you see how Paul described it in Ephesians? In the way you once walked, that's our manner of living. You remember our manner of living? For those of you who know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is a past life you can look at and say, I remember when. For those of you who don't know, this maybe doesn't make as much sense. For those of you who don't know Christ, it's the manner in which you are walking today. You are in the darkness. Oh, I know that you don't know that it's darkness. That's the whole point. Scripture goes on to say you're following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That means we're following the enemy of our soul. The one that Peter challenges us to be wary of. Because he is a roaring lion, what? Seeking whom he may devour. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's where I was. That's where I was. I walked there. I talked there. I, I, I followed those same paths. I was in the darkness experiencing the ability to see as, as well as I thought I could. It was not until Jesus brought light that I realized I couldn't see. I was fine. Everything around me was just exactly how I wanted it to be. You see, that's the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. His job, his role is to keep you blinded, keep you in the darkness so that you don't see. Scripture goes on to say in verse 3 of Ephesians 2, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh. I did what I wanted to do. I did what I wanted to do. I, I carried out the desires of the body and the mind, and I was by nature, by birth, by the fact of my existence apart from Christ, a child of wrath. That is man's normal state apart from God. We're dead in our trespasses and sin. All men, without Jesus, that is where, that is where you are. Just like the rest of mankind. And then there's the two most important words in the Bible. But God. Scripture says, but God being rich in what's it say? Mercy, but God being, what is the first thing that we're learning here about how does this, how does this come together? Where did it come from? It came from his mercy. It came from God's grace. So being rich in mercy, why? Because of the great love with which he loved us. See, the beautiful thing about God's love is it was before you could ever do anything for him. You couldn't do something to make God love you. He loved you already. And because he loved you already, 
John 3, 16 tells us, right? For God so the world that he gave his one and only son. His only son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have. Is that true? Because of his mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, meaning nothing we could do to earn it, he made us alive. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 3, verse 3. He says, Truly I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what being born again is like, being made alive, having your eyes open for the first time, seeing the light, as Paul on the road to Damascus did, realizing for the first time, perhaps, that you have been blinded and the activities and the desires of your life and of your heart were at enmity with God, meaning our natural state is war with him. But God, through his mercy, through his grace, he makes us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. So the first thing we see is, where does it come from? It comes from his great mercy. Scripture goes on to say, he caused us to be born again. Coming back to life, to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why does the, why does the resurrection matter? Because this is how it works. Because of the resurrection. What do I mean? Well, <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, when we have our moment with the Lord, and the Holy Spirit comes into our life. We enter into a position of salvation. He is making us a new person. We are united to Christ. You are united to Christ in his death, and you are united to Christ in his resurrection. When we go through the act of baptism. What is baptism? Baptism is a, an illustration. It's showing an event that already happened in your life. What happened? You put your faith and trust in Christ. You called upon his name. He entered into your life and you died with Christ. You go beneath the water to signify your death. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, then we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. So we go beneath the water in baptism signifying the death. I died. To my old life, my flesh, the desires to follow the prince of the power of the air, to be a child of wrath, a son of disobedience. I died to that, and then I'm raised by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be a new creation. I'm not me anymore. The Bible tells us, therefore, therefore, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's accomplished because Jesus rose from the dead. The Holy Spirit unites me to Christ so that his death is counted as my death. Now, the difference between me and Christ is, according to Romans 6.23, my death is justified, for the wages of sin is death. So I'm just getting what is already deserved. But Christ, he took my death for me. 
And because he who knew no sin became my sin for me, that I might become the righteousness of God, death could not hold him. So he rose. So I am united in death with Christ, the death to my old life, the death to sin, and I am raised to new life with him. So this is how we have been born again into a living hope. We've been born again into a living hope by his great mercy through the power of his resurrection. How is it that this occurs? How do we get to this place? One of my favorite places to look at this is Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, speaking of our bracha, it's a blessing, a, a song of blessing. Every once in a while, Paul breaks into a run-on sentence. Have you guys ever known people who do that? And his run-on sentence, he just gets so excited about what we have in Christ that he can't stop talking. He never puts a period in. So he would just go. That's a song of praise, a bracha, in Ephesians chapter 1. Toward the end of that bracha, in verses 13 and 14, he says, how is it that this occurs? How is it that you are born again? How do you enter into this relationship with the God of the universe? It says, in him... You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You don't have to wonder, what's the word of truth? It's the gospel of your salvation. And you believed in him. You put your trust in him. Then you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. It is inaugurated. And, the, and the, what's left behind when it occurs, the inauguration is, means that something has occurred. Something happened. But we're looking for a fulfillment down the line. There's a day when your salvation will be nearer than it is today. Though today, you, if your faith and trust is in Christ, you are absolutely secure. What do you mean? Well, right now, you are being saved. You are saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. And when you see Jesus face to face and you acquire the full possession of the loss of your sin nature, the broken parts of you, everything in you that was messed up or jacked up or twisted up, all the questions you have that you have no answers for, that you're frustrated about, everything in your life that causes you any in any way to be in any kind distant from God, Jesus is going to, with just one pass of his thumb across your cheek, he wipes away every, the Bible says, tear. All your sorrow, all your brokenness, all those things gone. Today we have an idea of what salvation is on that day you're going to hold it in both hands. You're going to feel it in all of your being. It's going to be so overwhelming. I don't even think you're going to be able to, to imagine it if you tried. So the guarantee that that's coming is the Holy Spirit he's given you. The Holy Spirit that God has given you is your wedding ring, the proof that you belong to him, that you are his, and he is yours. And he will finish what he has begun. For if he has begun a good work in you, he will be faithful to complete it. Amen? In Ephesians 1.18, it says, Then having the eyes of your heart enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So what is this? miracle of salvation that takes place the eyes of your heart are open and you see you understand you recognize you see the glory of christ through the gospel that was shared to you and just like the man that jesus described in luke 18 you find yourselves before the king of glory with your hands open wide 
and you call out for his mercy, which he is more than willing to give. In Luke 18, verse 10, it says, Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, those extortioners, unjust people, adulterers, <clears throat> even like this tax collector standing afar off. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the scripture says the tax collector just stood afar off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven. But rather he beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified. That's a description of what it is to be saved. What did, what did Paul do on the road to Damascus when the light shone from the heavens and he falls to the ground blinded? He can't see in this world, but he can see in the other. What did he do? He did what this man did. He beat his breast and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Lord told him what things he would do. What about Peter? What about Peter after denying Christ three times? What did he do? Was it different than this? <clears throat> Jesus comes to him in John 21 and asks him three times if he loved him. Can't you hear? Can't you see the illustration in Peter's relationship to Christ of him on his knees beating his breast and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner? And what happened? Lord, had mercy on him, a sinner. And he was justified. This is how we come <clears throat> into this, the beautiful statement of this living hope, being born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus, to a living hope, not a dying hope, a living hope. How do we enter into it? We hear the gospel. We put our faith and trust in him. We fall before the Lord on our knees and we cry out, have mercy on me, a sinner. Repent and believe. That's it. Simple, plain. What is the gospel? The gospel is this. You and I were separated from God. We're separated from him. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous. How many? No, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? We are in a place separated from God. But Romans 5.8 says that God's love toward us is shown this way, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So he makes provision. What's Romans 10, 9, and 10 tell us? That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So we can make the declaration that Joel did in Joel chapter 2. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The good news, the bad news of the gospel, we're separated from God. The good news, God sent his son. And if we hear the gospel and believe, cry out for his mercy, you have it. You have it. This is where our living hope comes from. This is where it is coming from. But what is my <clears throat> future expectation? That's a better word for hope for me. Because hope in English is like, well, I hope so. You know what I mean? Like you say, oh, is Jackie ever going to cut his hair? And somebody else will say, oh, I hope so. <laughs> and when you say, I hope so, it's like, well, I I hope so, but you don't really know, right? You're just hoping that maybe it will, maybe it won't. That's not this kind of hope. This hope is expectation. It's not a maybe he will or maybe he won't. This is absolute expectation. So what's your future absolute expectation, this living hope? What is it? In verse 4 it says, To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, 
ready to be revealed at the last time. So what's my future expectation? Inheritance. We are heirs and joint heirs together with Christ. That's our future expectation. That we have been born again into a living hope to have an inheritance that is secured for you. It's not one you couldn't secure it if you had to anyway. If it depended on us, we're not going to get there. Right? Uh, maybe you guys are better at those New Year's resolutions than me. The only one I've been able to keep is the one I don't make. So the point here, we have a future inheritance. What about this inheritance? What does it tell us about this inheritance? It's imperishable. It's never going away. It's not going to get spent. You know, for the young people here looking at mom and dad living on your inheritance, uh, before you thought of it as your inheritance, it was just what they made. Then we had kids and all the stuff we made became inheritance. So my, my, my kids aren't even fighting over the Harley anymore. I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Mine may disappear. But the one that we are born again into a living expectation, our future expectation in Christ, that never disappears. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. You can't mess it up. You guys ever bought something new and, you, and you're looking at how beautiful it is and then that first scratch happens? We, and we used to live in this place called Desperate Hot Things in California. <clears throat> and oh, it's, it is really called that. If you look on a map, it's Desert Hot Springs. But if you lived there, you called it Desperate Hot Things. So we're there in Desert Hot Springs. And we lived next door to this neighbor, had a really beautiful car. And I don't remember which one it is. Kathy will, will straighten it out for me later. But it's one of our two older boys. It's either Cole or JC. We're standing in their garage. And he's showing us this beautiful car. You remember? And... Uh, while he's telling us all the stuff about this car, and we're like, man, that's really awesome. I, my son went and got a little handful of dirt. And he walked over, and he put it on the fender. I don't know why. And then he just started rubbing it in. <laughs> so that brand new car was not undefiled. It was defiled. In fact, the next thing that my neighbor said, this was the last time he talked to me. He said, why would he do that? And I was like, why would you ask that question? He's a two-year-old. You should see this, what he does to my stuff. <laughs> this inheritance that we have in Christ is undefiled. No defect. It doesn't get scratched. There's, no, there's, there's nothing that can jeopardize your inheritance. Just listen to that for a minute. There's nothing that can jeopardize your inheritance. It is undefiled, and it is unfading. It's not fading away. It's not like, well, once it was really cool, but you know, now 20 years later, it's not so cool. If you wait long enough, 50 years, then they get cool again. But then you get to 70 or 80 years, and then it's not cool again. You know how things go. But the inheritance that we have through this living hope in Christ, this inheritance, it doesn't fade and here's how I want you to see that. It's not boring. It's brighter. The problem with us when we think about an eternity with Christ, all you can think about is ethereal, heavenly, weird things. Right? Like harps and clouds and all that stuff. Is that what you guys do? No? Okay, well, then maybe you're not broke like me. But listen, we are earthly. So how do we think of heaven? In beautiful earthly scapes, you get on top of a mountain and you see the sunrise and you look out over the woods or you're at a beach and you see the sunset at the beach or whatever the case may be, you look over these things and you think, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Well, whatever your hope, your inheritance is, is brighter than you can imagine and it's not boring. It's not sitting around in a circle with a bunch of drums singing kumbaya. 
unless singing kumbaya is your thing. And then maybe it is. <laughs> what is my point is, is it's, it is not fading. It does not diminish. That moment, the, the feeling you felt at the end of that video when it says he's the great I am, and that feeling of victory and rejoicing, you just want to shout, it's that multiplied by multiple thousands, hundreds of thousands, forever. It's that feeling, looking into the eyes of your Savior. <clears throat> this inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. But there's more. Where is it at? It's kept in heaven. It's not in the first bank or wherever you hide your good stuff. You guys know where that is? Yeah, you know that it doesn't always stay there? You ever knew where you put something and never found it again? This is still looking. Oh, good luck. Maybe today. I want you to understand that this is kept for you in heaven. Kept for you. Listen to the words he uses. Kept in heaven for you. It's not your job. It doesn't depend on you. Who does it depend on? It depends on Christ. I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded he is able to keep me into that day. And so he's saying it's kept in heaven for you. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. That's that one where you see his face and you go, man, I never thought it would feel like this. I mean, when I was saved, the, the feeling that I had in that moment was incredible. But that's nothing compared to what's going to happen when I see his face. When I'm before him. When he puts his arms around me and he brings me to his father. And he presents me to his father not having spot or blemish. Now, I don't know what I'm going to know in that day, but today I know I have spot and blemish. But you see, he who knew no sin became sin for me, that I might become the righteousness of God. So he covers me in his righteousness and shows me off to his dad. What's that going to be like? The incredible emotion that's going to pour from us in that moment. So we see we are being guarded through faith. So what's my, my future expectation and inheritance, undefiled, imperishable, not fading away? What's my present expectation? Well, yeah, so I'm, I'm born again to that living hope today. So the future, I got an idea. How I enter into it, I got an idea. <coughs> what's my present hope, my present expectation? My expectation today that I am being guarded through faith. I'm being guarded through faith. Though you who do not see, you believe. Look what he says. For a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe. What is my present expectation? Faith. That, that I believe i'm believing i'm trusting and i'm resting i'm being guarded i'm being kept i'm being held together through this faith that god has poured out upon us now anybody recognize that there's sorrow and grief in this world is there somebody here who doesn't have any of that well we know that just here in this room there are several families fighting battles, preparing to fight battles with cancer, surgeries coming up tomorrow, treatment in the future, people who are coming to the close of 
their treatment, people who are suffering through the loss of loved ones who, who have passed away and are now in the presence of God. That's sorrow and grief. Listen to what he said. He said, in this you rejoice, though for now it is necessary that you have been grieved by various trials. What's my present expectation? I have the faith of God in my life, faith in God. I'm being guarded by him, uh, and I will pass through the valley of the shadow of death. There will be grief and sorrow. There will be grief and sorrow. Life will still be hard. We will still face difficult things, even though you put your faith in Christ. I know sometimes we think, well, if I put my faith in Christ, then I'm never going to get sick, and I'm never going to struggle, and there'll never be an accident, and there'll never be anything that makes me weep all night long and all day the next day. But that's just not true. Grief and sorrow come. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9 says this, We are afflicted in every way. But we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. It goes on in verse 16 to say, So we do not lose heart. It's not our suffering and our grief that derails us. It's our suffering and grief that help us nail down the faith by which we are guarded. It is the proving ground. And the proving ground in the Bible is not the expectation of possible failure. Do you know that? Test pilots don't get in a plane they know is going to blow up. They get in a plane to test that plane's abilities because they know what that plane can do. That's what the testing and trials of our sorrow and grief is about. We don't lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. This, this body is falling apart. Some of us, our body's falling apart worse. Some are hanging together, but we all have one thing in common. One day, they're all going to go. You're going to need your knees replaced too. You're going to go through those things as our bodies wear out. <clears throat> Perhaps it's sickness that's going to take you to that. But though our outer body is perishing, wasting away, our inner self is renewed day by day. Your inner self, your spirit, that which came alive in Christ Jesus, that can't die. That is eternal. That's not going anywhere. Paul says in verse 17, For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory Beyond all comparison. Remember I told you that moment you see Jesus' face? Well, you look at Paul's life and the things that Paul went through and the struggles that he faced. And he calls all of that a light momentary affliction. And I know there are people here right now today who are going through and preparing to go through very difficult situations. And you're going to be tested through it. You're going you're to struggle and it's, it's hard. I get it. I get it, but your inner man is not wasting away. Your inner man is renewed day by day. Your inner man is growing as you keep your eyes on the prize of the eternal weight of glory. Verse 18, as we look not to the things which are seen, but to the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary. It's just temporary. If we have cancer, just temporary. No matter what. Heart disease, just temporary. Whatever we're facing, whatever pain that is in our life, the living hope that we've been born again to in Christ Jesus, he takes all of it. The psalmist declares that there is a bottle the Lord has. You know what he keeps in it? Your tears. Do you know why? Because your suffering matters to him. It's not that it doesn't matter, that he doesn't care, that none of that 
is a big deal. He's saying, no, far from it. Your suffering is working out an eternal way of glory. And it all, every tear you ever cried, the Lord is saying, every one of them matters to me. He keeps them. These things that we see, they are transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. We can't see yet, but we will. Yes? 2 Corinthians 6.10 says, As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. This is our attitude in rejoicing through the sorrow and grief. Yes, life, our expectancy for today is there will be sorrow and grief. But our expectancy for today is that we will have faith. Our expectancy for today is that we are being guarded. The Lord is keeping us. Also, our expectancy for today is that we would have love for though you have not seen him, you love him. Something happens. Once upon a time, there were a lot of things I treasured in life. A list I had once about all the things I had to accomplish before I was 30. Lists that I had about things I needed to possess. And throughout my life, I've had the opportunity to possess most of them. And the glory diminished and it faded away and it perished because it's not an inheritance that is imperishable. It was just stuff. And then I realized that Jesus is my treasure. And since Jesus is my treasure, there's nothing that can get in that way. So my expectancy as, a, as being born again into a living hope, the love of God is poured out in your life through the Holy Spirit that was given for you. Romans 5.5, 5, he has poured out his Holy Spirit through which you are able to love him. Deuteronomy 36 not 36, 30, pause, verse 6, talks about God regenerating your heart so that you will love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. <clears throat> you ever thought of the greatest command, the greatest command ever given, that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And then on the other hand, thought to yourself, how can I do that? I fall short of that. And then to realize that God's promise in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, is that he can give you a new heart through the new covenant, through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, by pouring his Holy Spirit into your life so that you will love the Lord your God, whom you have not seen, but you love. Present expectation. And then finally... He talks of the joy. He says, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The last thing he talks about here, our present expectation, is to see inexpressible joy filled with glory. I don't know what to describe what I feel when, when we do worship. I wish I could just sing and not be a sappy old man. I am crying all the time. I cry when I watch a video. I cry when they sing a song. I cry when the kids dance. I cry if we do an altar call and people come up. I cry if we're praying over people. Uh, it doesn't matter what happens. I cry. Always tears ready to spring to my eyes. Those, those tears in my eyes... It's, uh, it's not sorrow. Now, don't come up to me after church and say you want to take away my man card. <laughs> Those tears are not sorrow. Those tears are joy, inexpressible. I'm seeing glimpses of who Christ is. I'm feeling his presence. I'm, I'm sensing his love. I'm sensing him moving and working in the lives of others. All of these things are our present expectation of our living hope. 
our present expectation that is here now. Joy, inexpressible. Is this the last bit of joy? Is this the most joy we're ever going to have? Not even close, huh? I mean, I have, in sorrow, wept until I could not find any more tears. When Jesus turns that sorrow around, when he, when he wipes it away, when he takes care of it, isn't that sorrow replaced by joy? What is that moment like? What is that moment like when you're before the one who was beat by the fists of man because of the joy he saw in you? who for the joy set before him endured the shame. What, what's that moment? How much joy is going to be in that place? Whatever sorrow I've ever felt over someone who has gone before me, one day I'm going to look not only at my Savior's face, which will be the greatest joy there, but I'm going to recover the joy from the tears I shed over my brothers, friends, and family who are there now because I'm going to see them and I'm going to realize this is not it. This is not the fullness. This is not the completion of it all. Now, <clears throat> as we look, as we look at, uh, at verse 10, I want you to consider this, and we're going to read one other section of Scripture, and I'm, I'm going to pray. I promise it's almost over. 1 Peter uh, 1, verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. What's that mean? It means the prophets didn't always understand what they were prophesying. They still spoke. They still spoke the words that God gave them, but they didn't always see. See, we can see those prophecies clearly as we look to them through Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, Isaiah 53 is not much of a mystery anymore. But to Isaiah it was, a bit. But it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. It was not for them. It was revealed that they were serving you. This was for those who would come later, who would recognize and who would understand. <clears throat> they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you, through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things even the angels want to look into. See, there's no salvation for the angels. You are either elect or evil. That's it. Two classes. No redemption. Redemption is a human issue. God's redemption of man. And as you contemplate the things that we've talked about, and hopefully I haven't not just confused you and you say, I have no idea what Jackie's talking about anymore. I hope you realize that I'm talking about the living hope that we have through the resurrection of Christ, that it came from his mercy through his resurrection. And we receive it when we hear the gospel and we call upon his name. I hope you realize your future expectation is that you have an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, and unfaded, kept in heaven for you. I hope you know your present expectation is that he has given you faith. You are being guarded. There will be sorrow and grief, but he will also pour out his love in your life, and you will have joy inexpressible. And as you think about those things, just hold that thought in your mind. And here... What Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, from 12 to 20. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? 
If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ is raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is empty, it's vain. And your faith is empty, it's vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. We're all charlatans and liars because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are just dead. And if Christ, if in Christ only we have hope in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by one man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. But Christ is risen from the grave. And so we have been born again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen? Amen. Why don't you guys stand with me? Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you this morning, <clears throat> we were really looking forward to a sunny, warm spring morning, but we had rain and snow, which we thank you for. But Lord God, uh, I just pray for those who are gathered in this place today. I pray for those who don't know you. I pray that they would surrender the battle stop fighting the life of the living dead is not a life worth living but rather that they would come to you and have their but god moment but god who is rich in his mercy has made me alive together with christ lord i pray that you would move in the hearts of those who are facing struggles, illnesses, sicknesses, um, pain, sorrow, and grief. Lord, that you would help their faith to grow, that they would know that they are shielded, guarded, kept by you, Lord, that you will pour your love out upon them and there will be joy inexpressible. And while they're outer man may be perishing their inner man is growing stronger by the day God I pray that you would minister to the hearts of all that are gathered in this place and as we close out this morning and we have elders and deacons available for prayer folks spread around the church I pray Lord if there is somebody here today that does not know you as their Lord and Savior that they would take the time and lay down their pride and come make a proclamation of faith in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would move in our midst by the power of your spirit, that you would be glorified and magnified in and through it all. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do our doxology. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory 
with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. God bless you guys. Happy Resurrection Day.